Have you ever wanted to ask a really successful artist that you admire like crazy and ask them what one thing they did to become so skilled? I know I've wanted to. We're always searching for that magic wand, magic pill, whatever you want to call it, that is going to result in a huge spike of talent and improvement in our artwork overnight. And while I don't have that magic wand or pill for you because, let's be real, <laughs> absolutely does not exist. I do have a handful of things that I've done over the years that actually has allowed myself to get better at painting animals. If you're new here, hey, I'm Danny, a self-taught artist that obsesses about animals and creates art of them with oil paint. While we chat, let's bring this barn owl portrait to life here. I've been spending so much of my creative energy on work art recently, which is amazing because it allows me to make a living with my artwork. But now and then it's like a balm for the artist's soul to paint something just because we love it. If you want to hear more about stuff like this, like how I manage my art workload as a full-time artist, then leave me a comment on this video. It could be fun to share that information with you lovely folks out there. So over the years, I have developed a couple of things that in hindsight have allowed me to get better at painting animals. So maybe you can find some use in this too. It's not a very neat and tidy list, but we'll get through it anyways. So one of the first things that I did, and I started this pretty early on in my artist career, and it's one of the things that I wish I did sooner. And frankly, I should do more often because it's fun and it's super helpful but is actually giving myself timed challenges. So what I mean by this is basically I've got a painting that I'm gonna be doing. Let's say, you know, I'm painting a barn owl here. Let's say my goal was to paint this entire barn owl portrait in one hour or a set number of hours or minutes or whatever you wanna do. And you actually set yourself a timer and you rush as much as possible to get all of that done in that amount of time. Sounds a little stressful, but it can be, but it's so helpful and honestly a lot of fun. So the reason why this actually did wonders for helping me to figure out, you know, how to get better at painting animals is because you're on that wicked time crunch. It actually forces you to decide what's important and what's not important when painting animals. Now, you might be thinking, well, it's all important, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> You might be thinking that every teeny tiny little hair matters, but in reality it doesn't. And when you just simply don't have time for all that crazy intensive detail, you can learn where it's important and where it isn't. So when I say where it's important and where it isn't is kind of a decision that you have to make as the artist and every piece is different. If for instance, you're painting a portrait of an animal, more often than not, you're gonna want the face to be the focus because that's you know typically gonna be one of the first things a viewer is gonna look at. So that face is where you can spend most of your time where you can pack the most detail, put the most attention. And then as you move away from that face, you can spend less time on it. You can allow some texture to play, use bigger brushes. You don't have to go crazy with the detail all that good stuff. And because you're putting your attention to where the important bits are, AKA the face, you're still gonna get a really high impact painting that looks amazing, uh, but you didn't spend hours upon hours upon hours doing all those little finicky details in places that don't really matter. So to kind of get back to it, that time crunch when you're giving yourself a time challenge it makes you figure out where those important features are in the painting, just because you don't have time to do everything. So like I mentioned, if you're doing a portrait, it's typically gonna be the face, specifically the eyes and the nose or like animal beak, it'll be muzzle area, because that's typically where a viewer will look first. You can totally change this. If you want to put focus on a different part of the painting, you make that decision. But that decision is something that's really helpful to be able to figure out before you start so that you're not fumbling as you go, especially if you are setting yourself a nice time crunch. So 
For instance, to give you an example of a type of portrait I love doing where the focus is not really on the face, is actually doing a dark portrait with really strong backlighting that gives a really cool halo. So this actually puts the emphasis on the periphery of the portrait. So let's say you're painting a cat that is, you know, there's a strong light source behind it, the background's really dark. All of that fluff, that fur that's gonna be kind of on the outside of the cat is gonna be lit up super bright, whereas the background and the actual cat itself is gonna be quite dark. So your focus here is actually gonna be on that outer fluff. And if you decide that when you're going into your painting, you don't actually have to pack a lot of detail or you know even put that much effort into a lot of those other areas, but you can focus on the area that's important here. This example being that nice, beautiful, bright halo of fur that's gonna be surrounding the periphery of your portrait. So another reason why I loved time challenges is because it actually forces you to embrace texture that you're creating in your artwork because you kind of have to get a little loose and crazy in order to actually get stuff done when you're painting. You kind of need to get a little messy with it and maybe use brushes that are bigger than you normally do to be able to cover, you know, more area in a short period of time. And inevitably you're gonna get some texture. And one of the things that I found when I first started doing these time challenges is I loved that texture. Previous to this, I was giving myself way too much time to do all these tiny details. And I was actually getting rid of a lot of that juicy texture that I now love. So operating on a time crunch actually allows you to get that texture in there and kind of makes you leave it because you don't really have time to go back and, you know, smooth it out and whatever. And I love the way that looks in artwork. So sometimes I like to leave that texture in it, even if I'm not doing a time challenge. Another thing that I did that actually really helped me to improve my animal paintings. And this one seems a little bit weird because it's probably not something that, you know, a big fancy art school is going to teach you, but it's something that I definitely found for myself is that actually allowing myself to have a good time and play with my artwork was essential for building up my skill. And the reason why was because it allowed me to actually experiment with different techniques, different styles, you know, even the time trials that I was just talking about, that was an effort of trying to make my artwork more playful and to make it feel better for myself. And as a result, I changed my art style completely in a way that I absolutely adore and it allowed me to really improve my skill. So sometimes you need to let yourself play. You need to let yourself make mistakes because yeah, you might discover some things, you know, some new techniques that you absolutely love, new ways to create these animal paintings that you love. You're also gonna discover some things that just don't work. And sometimes you actually do have to discover those. You'll make mistakes and then hopefully you can learn from your mistakes if you realize that you hate the way something looks or you struggled endlessly with it, what have you. Learning about that makes a huge difference because you can learn that lesson and avoid it in the future. And especially if you know, you've know discovered something you just really hate doing, then don't do it. Find a different way to do it. But sometimes you don't know unless you allow yourself to explore with your artwork and actually play. Now, the final little tip here, the thing that allowed me to improve my animal art, um, and this is actually a really simple tip that I recommend anyone try if they like painting animals, is actually blurring my reference photo. So what I mean by this is, you know, typically if you're painting, you're trying to paint realistic wildlife, you often have a reference photo because let's be real, painting animals is hard and you cannot be expected to have a whole library of realistic animal references in your head. So use a reference photo. But blurring it, so popping it in any, you know, digital program, whether it be Photoshop or Procreate or pretty much anything, and blurring it slightly is actually gonna be immensely helpful for improving your animal artwork and overall creating a much stronger painting. So here's the thing. 
animals in nature have a lot of detail. If you're looking at those reference photos, typically the ones that are most valuable are very crisp and clear and have a lot of detail. And sometimes when you're painting or creating artwork of these animals from that reference photo, it can be really hard to look past that. And as a result, while you're working through your painting, you're fixating way too much on those details. And as a result, you're not actually building a solid foundation for your artwork. And that's gonna result in weak art. It's not gonna have, you know, that wow factor. It's not gonna have that oomph that you want. So what happens here is you've got all of that crazy detail, no real foundation to work from because you're focusing on all of that detail in your reference photo. But if you blur your reference photo to start when you're building that sort of underpainting, building the foundation of your artwork, well, you don't have that detail to even focus on. Instead, you're focusing on those larger swatches of colors that are gonna allow you to really build up a strong foundation. And then you can pull into your original reference photo with all that juicy detail and apply that juicy detail to your strong foundation. So I recommend actually giving it a little bit of a shot. It could be a total game changer for you. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Those are a small handful of things that I've done over the years that actually have had a huge effect on improving my artwork. And I highly recommend you give them a shot yourself. Now, if you want to learn how to paint realistic wildlife easily, I think you would love the Wildlife Painting Academy. This is my pride and joy. It's a massive library that I have built, full tutorials on how to paint a big range of animals with oil paint. There's also lots of tips for painting with acrylics as well. So if this sounds like something that you would enjoy, I highly recommend you checking it out in the link in this video description. All right, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.